Hello and welcome to Direct Approach with Wayne Moorhead, an exclusive podcast by DSN filled with candid and insightful conversations with leading corporate executives about today's evolving direct sales channel. On this episode, Wayne interviews Brian Gill, CMO of For Life. For Life, known as the Immune System Company, was founded in 1998 on four values, science, success, service, and satisfaction. As CMO, Brian believes that everything is boring and loves the challenge of engaging an ever-distracted audience of customers and distributors. Brian also believes brand connection, the connection between a company's brand and distributor's brands, is the key to differentiation, loyalty, and long-term success. Wayne and Brian unpack the concept of brand connection and talk about the power of saying yes, attraction marketing, and how companies can compete against the gig economy. Plus, they dive into For Life's massive success in the Hispanic community and what they do differently to engage this rapidly growing market that is projected to reach more than 19 billion by 2028. Before we begin, did you know that DSN is powered by the direct selling community? DSN is honored to be supported by industry suppliers that partner with companies across the channel to help enhance, streamline, and grow your businesses. This episode is sponsored by PayQuicker. Your business moves fast, but is your money keeping up? PayQuicker's award-winning solution lets your business make payouts across the globe instantly. Send payments to over 200 countries and territories in more than 40 currencies through PayQuicker's secure API with funds available to spend immediately. PayQuicker is a fully customizable, white-label payment platform, letting you offer branded debit cards, instant virtual cards, global bank transfers, mobile wallets, cash, and more. Plus, you get their bank rate security and global compliance coupled with multilingual account support so you can focus on growing your business. Start paying your Salesforce instantly with the largest global payout provider to direct selling organizations because faster payouts to your distributors means they grow their business and yours faster. Learn today at payquicker.com. Now, please help me welcome your host, Wayne Moorhead, and today's guest, Brian Gill, CMO of For Life. Hello, and welcome to another episode of DSN's Direct Approach Podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Moorhead, and today's guest is an incredible direct selling marketer. He's held marketing roles at one of the largest public direct selling companies, also at an Inc. 500 direct selling company where he helped build their billion dollar brand, as well as other well-known companies in the space. I've been fortunate to work alongside him for several years in two different companies early in our career. um, And I'm even more fortunate to call him friend. I'm excited to welcome For Life's CMO, Brian Gill. Brian, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Wayne. I am a regular listener of the Direct Approach podcast. I've really been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, We've talked about having you on the podcast many times, and I'm glad that the scheduling and everything finally worked out. Um, Also, again, as I kind of mentioned, we've worked together uh, before early in in both of our careers, which it's now sad how long ago uh, that's starting to seem and and feel. From our previous working experience and from from incredible recommendations, you were literally the first uh, phone call that I made joining a new company and really kind of just begging you to come help with the marketing and communication and helping to kind of grow and scale and put some great structure uh, around the marketing efforts there. Um, it was early in our careers, as I mentioned. It was in the early days of, of this startup. We were using our own computers. I think we were on card tables. Pretty sure we didn't have um, health insurance at the time. And at that point, the, the marketing team was uh, me, you, and the incredible designer, uh, Gary DeMille. So, you know, a, a really fun group to kind of start out and, and be in the trenches with. And I know for me, it was an incredible ride. I, I've learned so much. Um, and so loved that experience with you. Yeah, those, those were the early days. And that was a hard decision to go from a really well-established, one of the best companies in the industry to what was an unknown at that time. And so saying yes to that opportunity with you was scary. Um, but I think saying yes is important. And my journey in this industry kind of began a little bit before that, where, uh, is it okay if I tell about how I- Please, kind of, I, yeah, I'd, love, the I'd love to know how you, yeah, please do. So Japan, in one word, Japan led me to this industry. I was serving a mission for uh, my church in, in Fukuoka, Japan in the mid nineties. 
And after spreading the good word for a couple of years, I, I came home and I thought to myself, I'm going to be filthy rich <laughs> because I, cause I could speak Japanese. And so, well, what did I do? I, I found a job speaking Japanese in customer service at a wonderful uh, direct sales company. And sure enough, I was making a dollar more than the English speaking customer service agents. So I was well on my way to achieve my goals of being filthy rich. And so I was doing that. And then this company was sending out a newsletter every month. I thought it was a great idea. I liked it. Uh, but the company didn't have a writer or an editor at the time. And uh, I saw some room for improvement on that. So I literally took a hard copy of the newsletter. I redlined it and I took it into the CEO's office, which at age 21, you know, I, it's gutsy. It's pretty, pretty gutsy. I'm a, I'm a CS agent. And I just said, Hey, here's the newsletter. I love it. Here's a, what I would recommend to, to make it even better. And I proposed that I split my time 50, 50 on Japanese customer service and this writing editing. And can we see where it goes? And he said, yes, he's a, he was a great individual. He is a great individual and open-minded. And so put that on the table and, you know, let that sit for a while and did both jobs. And I, I began to realize that maybe speaking Japanese wasn't going to be my ticket to wealth and fame because more often than I'd like to admit, people would say to me, the, the distributors would say to me, Hey, can I speak to someone that speaks Japanese? And, and I would say, yeah, I'm, I am speaking to you right now in Japanese. And that never went over well. They still wanted to speak to somebody that spoke Japanese. So I was at a crossroads. And so I said yes to that, that opportunity to take kind of a native skill I had in communications and writing. And I charted a new, I charted a new path. And I think that's important to to do that early in your career and all throughout your career is to say yes, where you can. And um, so I said yes to that opportunity, but I also asked the question. It wasn't actually presented to me. I, I created that opportunity by asking a question and seeing if there was a possibility there. So while uh, uh, I'm in the direct sales industry and marketing all of a sudden in writing and editing and communications, and then it just continues to grow from there where I eventually met up with you at the two companies that we worked at and um, you know, the rest of the story can unfold, but I'll stop there. See if you have any. Yeah. Any I love that back. story. I actually didn't know that um, that kind of origin story uh, that you gave there about kind of taking that initiative around the newsletter um, again, gutsy. Don't know if it was exactly the right move to walk into a, a CEO's office, uh, but it obviously paid off. Um, it, it was the right decision. Um, I'd never heard that. So I, I think that's really cool. And again, as it kind of relates to this idea of, of saying yes, it, it doesn't always necessarily need to be, uh, and I think your story is a great example of this, but it doesn't need to be quitting your job. Again, as, as you mentioned, both both you and I left the relative comfort of a large, well-established company to go into the startup world, um, really, I think, at least for me, it was to get opportunities that I wouldn't otherwise have at, at that point in my career. Um, but I'd love your a little more thoughts on what are some of these other ways that we can say yes to opportunities that don't have to be this kind of extreme shift in companies, but can be more of kind of, you know, grow where you're planted. Any other thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, just keeping with young in your career, I think it's important to be very opportunistic. Um, he or she with the most energy wins. Just say yes and figure it out is kind of my default philosophy. Uh, in fact, that's kind of what I did with this podcast invitation. Personally, professionally right now, I'm preparing for five presentations that I have to give uh, in the next month or two. And so... Um, you know, I was thinking, Wayne, why couldn't you have asked me uh, <laughs> to do this during a time of famine? This is a time of feast. And so it's hard to say yes to this. It's also intimidating. Um, why is it intimidating? Because, you know, for those of you that don't know, I reported to Wayne at, you know, at the companies that we worked at. He was my boss and mentor. He still is my mentor. And um, one thing he taught me is that uh, he says to me, Brian, I have forgotten more 
about I never, marketing. I never than said you will that. ever know. <laughs> I have never no, I, said that to somebody. That, that is true, but keep it, keep it in there. Um, <laughs> no. But Wayne, you know, so for me to come on a podcast with Wayne is intimidating. And then to know the audience of this, this is the who's who of the industry that listen to this. And so what I'm trying to say here is a principle that I believe in is never say no if it's based on fear. If there's a good opportunity there, and we're talking just, just you right now, go for it. Say yes and figure it out. Work overtime, work extra, and do everything you can to make these opportunities come to fruition. Uh, because that's what they're there for. They're supposed to be hard, and that's what opportunities are. They, it's you doing what you're supposed to be doing, planting or, or, or standing where you're supposed to lift and growing where you plant and all that stuff. But to do extra and to do more and show that value to the company. Uh, now, as I as you progress in your career and as things uh, continue down the path, I think that it is important to say no, uh, especially if you're managing a team. Because you know, I manage a team at Four Life. I, I have just a team of superstars, and and they're they're hungry. They're coming up with great ideas all the time. And it, it is important to be able to be a good judge of what works for the department and the company and the distributors at that time. So there is a time to say no uh, as well. I, I think that's an incredible insight. I, I want to circle back on, on two things you said there. I love that you brought up um, this idea of saying yes to things that might scare you, that were, might be rooted in fear on, on any level. And I think that I hadn't thought of it that way, but that really is a great indicator of some of those things you may want to say yes to, to lean into from a personal growth, professional growth standpoint, kind of where, where that fear is, is maybe where growth lies as well. Uh, I also love that you focused on the importance of saying no at times. And I think that's something that I've been bad at in, in my career um, in the effort to kind of say yes and to really do my job and to contribute um, always wanted to say yes, but I think you're right. There are really important times that you need to say no as well, whether it's boundaries, whether it's to s strategies or initiatives that might not, um, forward the overall goal uh, of the company. I think that's a really important insight. Yeah. It, thanks Wayne. And one more thing on this. I, I, I think that the answer to this question is what should you say yes to is, is like the, the, the right answer to probably most all questions. And that's, it's depends. It, it depends. Mm -hmm. But to be hyperbolic and to be a little bit more intriguing and divisive, I would say, say yes to everything. And in saying yes to everything, um, that means that you can also say no. So for example, an opportunity to be on this podcast, that's a clear yes. But if there's something that you should say no to, you say no to it because it allows you to say yes to something else. You shouldn't just take everything that comes your way, because when you do, there's an opportunity cost for something professionally or personally that you're giving up. And so you can always, in a sense, have a mindset of saying yes, but actually sometimes you say no and you give respect to those other more important things in your life. That's really wise. I think that's a, a really great um, insight and perspective. I love that. I'm going to have to noodle on that for a little while, Brian. Cool. Cool. So as CMO there at For Life, one of your main responsibilities ultimately is to create a strong brand, to create these meaningful experiences um, across touch points, you know, whether it's on the website, collateral, packaging, even down to you know, the IBR, the on-hold message, you know, in customer service. These are all touch points that allow us to create experiences and also to create connections. And I know that you have a really interesting perspective on kind of branding and brand building within direct selling as it kind of relates to creating these connections. And can you share your thoughts um, kind of on that overall philosophy and approach? Yeah. So my, my perspective reflects the evolution of a brand. So back in the day, my understanding that the origin of a brand is the logo on one's cattle. Those are my cattle and that's my mark. That's my logo. Those are your cattle, clearly. And so we, we 
we rebranded people back in the day. It was one way, one way messaging and you love our company and this is what you love about it and why. Uh, because the customers, the cattle back then, if you can follow this analogy with me, they couldn't speak. They had no platform. They were silent. But in the social and digital era, people are brands. They have brands. And they have a platform with a megaphone to talk about that. So you, you can see that with all of your friends and peers on whatever social network it is, they're portraying a brand. They have preferences, things that they like, and things that they talk about. So the brand connection is an effort to co-brand at points where the company and the distributor lend one another credibility. So let me give you an example of that. I was at the dentist a couple of years ago, and after the appointment, the hygienist uh, asked me if I wanted a toothbrush, which is very normal, and I did. I said I would like one, and she said, have you ever tried an electric toothbrush? And I said, no. And then she said something that kind of changed the way I think about branding and kind of gave birth to the brand connection. She said, did you know that electric toothbrushes are clinically proven to fight gingivitis and plaque better than a regular toothbrush? And in that instance, I, I heard something credible, a clinical study from a credible person, a dentist, a dental assistant. And so I was sold immediately. I didn't say, wait a second, is this one of those dentist offices? You know, like what industry is this? What's your angle? Didn't matter. Clinical study, it clearly showed there was an, a better alternative to what I was currently using. So I went to Costco that Christmas and bought myself Philips Sonicare two pack. And my wife and I have never looked back. To me, that was a brand connection. And I thought, well, how can we do this at For Life? And we were in the process of preparing a new product for our upcoming convention about a year away. And I, I went to the team and I said, can we do a clinical study that will prove that this product is, is better in some way than what, uh, what people are currently taking for their immune system health. So this product is called Immune Boost. It's a kind of a break the glass, think emergency type product. And we developed a clinical study that ended in this claim. Four life transfer factor is clinically proven to activate the immune system within two hours. So in that kind of tip of spear marketing claim, you have something that's clinically proven to do something in a short amount of time. So it's fast acting. And we've run with this at Four life we launched, we launched the product at convention with this claim and a supporting video that showed how transfer factor works in the body and does its job within two hours. And it was very powerful. And to this day, it's, it's, it's the lead marketing point for our distributors. So now back to the brand connection. How is that a brand connection? Well, it's a point of intersection where the company lends the distributor credibility and the distributor lends the company credibility. How does that happen? Every time the distributor goes out and talks about it, behind them, they have for life research, 25 year company, clinical study, awesome video. That's credibility. And then when the distributor uses their influence on their social platforms, their in-person circles of influence to talk about for life, they lend us credibility. And that's the, the co-branding that we're seeking at For Life. I think that's really interesting. And, and you touched on some, um, some really cool points. I love that you talked about um, lending the credibility back and forth. The, the blood flows both ways there. That, that credibility is going to go back and forth. Um, I think for good and for bad, for kind of both yeah. brands. So I think if you're not kind of managing... Um, or helping to kind of educate around product, around claims, around those things that there's the chance for potential contagion, you know, a, a negative brand experience. But more importantly, there is that positive brand experience that that goes both ways. And I think that um, it's even more powerful now, I think, than it ever has been where so many of our distributors or, or uh, affiliates they have their own personal brands. That that's really kind of a generally new phenomenon where uh, people had circles of influence, but were relatively small. 
Um, now their circles of influence are exponential friends, families, followers, um, and they've created their own brands. And so for me as a marketer, and, and I know that we've talked about this before, but it's changed my approach a little bit to give them kind of more freedom than I otherwise maybe would have in the past as a CMO yeah. to say, here's the brand, here's our brand, here's our information, here's our product. Go make it part of your brand, go bring it into your world and make it part of your world. And I think that's a really interesting shift that we are still understanding exactly kind of how to figure out best practices. What have you seen around that, this kind of rise of th these personal brands around our um, distributors and affiliates? And sometimes that happens prior to them joining our companies. And sometimes that happens, you know, down the road after what, what are, what are you seeing as it relates to that? Well, I love the rise of the personal brands. I think it keeps things fresh and interesting and it makes us try harder <clears throat> because I think somebody hearing my philosophy on the brand connection could, could think to themselves, okay, at my company, what do we have that is a brand connection? And yes, you could say everything, all of my products, all of my programs, all of my charitable efforts, lend credibility, all of our sales. And, and, and the answer to that is yes, I agree, but are they all good enough? Are they all interesting enough? Are they all compelling enough to meet up with the, the people's brands? They, people, we talk about saying yes, Wayne, earlier in the podcast, influencers, people on social media, they're saying yes and no to things that fit and don't fit with their brand. Yeah. And so I, I think as, as marketers and salespeople, we need to try harder. So let's talk about trying harder as a principle. I, I think about in the direct selling industry, I can't think of a company who offers products that aren't beneficial for you in some way that, that don't really just flat out just speak for themselves. And I think that we can become complacent with that mindset of, well, clearly this product is beneficial for you, whether it's a, a self-defense product or a financial service or all the health and wellness supplements. And it's easy to sit back and just say, here's the product and packaging, here's some key points, go for it. I think we need to do more than that and try harder. So, um, well, let me just ask you, Wayne, what yeah. products, what products do you think, this is a risk. Cause I have, I have in my mind, the correct answer. So it's kind of one of those things <laughs> where I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. And if you, and if you don't answer it, it in, in my mind, correct, I'll just say what, what I think it is, but I'm curious, what type of products do you think have the best marketing in the whole world? Like in just in all of consumerism, are you talking brands or types of products, types of products? Um, that you see on TV. I'm going to be honest. Like... I see, I see great marketing in every category and I see terrible marketing in, in every category. And I'm, I'm saying that that's across sales channels. So I, I think there could be great examples of both products that I would never otherwise consider sometimes just, again, maybe it's because I come from a marketing and advertising background. I love a lot of their um, advertising, a lot of their marketing. Um, so I'm probably going to, that's probably the wrong answer, not what you're looking for, but I see both really good and really bad across every product category. Well, that's, I think it's a really good answer. It's a better answer than mine. I'm looking at, I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit hyperbolic here. I think, I think straight up your answer is probably the best answer, but here's the point I want to make. I think some of the best marketing comes from some of the worst for you products. Oh, sure. Th think sugary cereals, candy bars, cigarettes, um, these industries have to try harder because they can't just say, clearly this product is good for your heart health and you're, you're interested in that. So I'm sure you want to buy it. No, it, they have to convince us that this thing that is really bad for you is somehow appealing. And I like to take that mindset to branding and direct sales where we have to overcome the luxury of having wonderful products. I think we need to try harder. And so back to the brand connection, if anybody out there was thinking, like I said, Brian, everything's a brand connection. Well, yes, but how can we try harder? How can we launch immune, immune boost, not just at convention and announcing it on stage, stage, but have thought a year and a half prior to develop a clinical study to support it, to have worked on an amazing video 
that supports it and that they can use to create digital media kits, which is our vernacular for we provide our distributors with stories that they can download and share on social media to, to do attraction marketing for this product. Uh, so trying harder with things that we really think are compelling for the brand. I absolutely love this idea uh, that you've been discussing and illuminating around this idea of trying harder. Uh, and I really agree. I, I can tell you a couple of places my, my mind went. We absolutely, especially in today's world of influencers, affiliates, people that have their, their own personal brands, we have to try harder to attract and retain them, um, especially over time, because they have their own you know, inherent platforms that they could take somewhere else to another company to promote other products. Um, and so I think we need to definitely up our game to make sure that we are servicing and retaining and meeting their expectations. I think most importantly, uh, to help retain those people because they have um, so much more, you know, I'll, I'll call it political or social power or impact than they, than they have in the past. And also, I think that even kind of trickles down just at the consumer level that maybe um, doesn't have such a huge social following. But I think we need to try harder from a systems perspective, from a process perspective, from a support perspective. I think at times we've felt like we've had this captive audience that are willing to um, kind of jump through hoops and just kind of deal with maybe our platforms or maybe a back office that doesn't work as well or a enrollment or a purchasing process that might be a little too clunky with way too many steps. Uh, people aren't willing to deal with that as much today as they used to be. And so I think we have to try harder on that level as well. And just to make sure that this direct selling opportunity that we offer is compelling um, and relevant in an ever increasingly competitive environment around additional streams of income. Yeah. Should we, should we talk about the competitive environment and kind of how we Let's can tackle yeah. that? So this is something I think about a lot. It's important to have focus and, you talk about trying harder for the distributor who wants, who wants probably, let's just focus on two things. They want the next shiny thing. And let's talk about that as um, the new opportunities, call it AI, metaverse, things that are on, that are coming or that are here now a little bit, but still kind of not fully scoped out. They want all the tools that, you know, vendors or people that provide services to our industry all these tools that they develop, the distributors want that kind of stuff. And it's important, I think, from executive leadership to be scanning the horizon all the time for those types of things and, and recognizing that it's placing bets. Uh, I remember, you know, I've, I'm an avid fan and attender of DSU and DSA events. And a couple of years ago, we were talking about the metaverse. And I mean, I'm not an expert, but I'm pretty sure through my reading that the economy has slowed the, the growth and excitement about the metaverse because um, there's just barriers, there's financial barriers, there's hardware barriers where, you know, putting something on, it kind of blocks your experience with reality. It's just not quite there yet. And, and then in comes artificial intelligence, which is here and now and free and easy and super helpful. So the metaverse, was it a, a winning horse? Maybe not for now. Will AI be? We'll see. I remember back at the company that we worked at, I was helping to start the social media department back when social media was starting. And do you remember we focused on a few social networks and, and there was one that I thought was going to be the most important social network because of who backed it, but that doesn't exist anymore, Google+. Plus. So it's important that we are there looking ahead for our distributors so that around every corner, there's opportunity for them. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, and I think it's the most important thing, is that we're solving problems here and now. Like you talked about, Wayne, platforms and systems and tech and shopping and the buying experience. There's a lot of problems that we still should be solving before we're looking at the metaverse, so to speak. Uh, quick story, I was in Virginia a few weeks ago, back on the East Coast where we're from. And I was in an Uber and the Uber driver, 
he got a ping on his phone and I glanced at it and it said $3 and 20 cents. And he tapped on it and another ding happened. And I, I just hadn't seen that before because I was actually sitting in the front seat and I, I didn't usually sit in the front seat, but I saw that happen. And I said, did you just accept a ride for three twenty? And he said, yes. And I was like, are, are you excited about that? Uh, like a ride for $3 and 20 cents. And he said, yes, because Uber offers a bonus where if you complete 50 rides in a certain amount of time, we get a bonus. And I didn't know that. I, I knew back in the day that at least at one point they didn't have that. And short rides were not desirable by an Uber, Uber driver. And if you were ever the person that wanted a short ride, you kind of were wondering, is anybody going to accept my ride and pick me up? So let's call that a problem for Uber. People want short rides. Drivers don't want to give them. So Uber's solution was to provide a bonus program for just get 50 rides. Get 50 one-mile rides and you get a significant bonus. So that's the kind of stuff that in our industry, I still think we have a lot of ground to cover. And at the DSA and the DSU events, we talk about those things a lot. It's improving the buying experience and the customer journey and the company journey. So for example, at For Life, um, okay, so let's say problem. The distributor opportunity on retail sites like Amazon is being undermined because people can sell product on Amazon at a lower price than retail or even wholesale. So that's a problem for distributors because when they go and approach somebody, they don't have the best deal. They say, hey, I'm sharing you my discount. Here's this product. The customer goes on Amazon and says, oh, actually, you don't have the best deal. So I think that unravels the whole distributor opportunity for our industry. So For Life, like many companies, have gone on and taken control of their brand presence on Amazon so that they can firmly establish that map price or that retail price, which validates the distributor opportunity. I think there's tons of problems and solutions like that that we should be focusing on as an industry. Uh, let me just share one more. Um, and then no, I'll please, I'd love see, to, if have any yeah. com- see if you have any comments. But um, at 4Life, we had requests from distributors who had contacts that were social influencers. In other words, they had a large following on social media. And they wanted to be a part of 4Life and sell our products to earn a simple commission. But they didn't want to be a part of 4Life and the network marketing side. They wanted no association with that, in fact. And there's a population of people out there. And at the time, we didn't have a door for them to walk through. We had a preferred customer door where you could open that up and just enjoy our products at a discount. And we had a second door where you could become an affiliate. That's our word for distributor. So you could become a distributor and you can build a team and earn uh, multi-level commissions but we didn't have that third door. So as a result of that request from one of our great distributor leaders, we opened up a a social influencer program. We call it a brand ambassador program, but I know that many companies in the industry call theirs uh, something like a social influencer program. So again, there's a problem. And what can we do to solve that right here and now? I just think there are so many of those that we can do for our distributors that are right in front of us. Oh, I think that's those are really great examples, um, ones that are especially really timely. Everyone in the channel is laser focused on growth, and we've identified one area where smart, innovative, and nimble companies are making notable gains, the Hispanic and Latino market, both in the U.S. and abroad. The Hispanic market is projected to reach more than $19 billion by 2028 and companies like the DSN Bravo Growth Award winner, Princess House, and other companies like Herbalife, Immunitech, Better Word in Mexico, OmniLife, Nice and Bella, and Vivri are doing very well in this market in both countries. At the DSU Fall event, we are bringing some of the other power players in these markets, like Forlife, life Actives, HiSight, PM International, and Vita Divina to the stage 
to share proven strategies that connect and engage with this incredible community and market. They'll be sharing their expertise and how to reach these potential consumers and distributors, what sets them apart, what they value, and how they want to interact with direct selling. Register today at dsu2023.com to join 500 of your executive peers on October 11th and 12th in Irving, Texas. This episode is also sponsored by QuickBox. Are you a part of a brand that is looking for a hassle-free and efficient way to handle your order fulfillment? Look no further than QuickBox. QuickBox is the ultimate solution for all of your fulfillment needs. With their state-of-the-art technology and lightning-fast service, QuickBox ensures that your orders are processed, packed, and shipped accurately and on time, every time. Say goodbye to fulfillment headaches and say hello to QuickBox. Visit quickbox.com for more information. That's Q-U-I-C-K-B-O-X.com and experience the fulfillment revolution today. This episode is also sponsored by GenCon. Constant innovation and stability are the keys to GenCon's fifth decade of success in the direct selling industry. GenCon's newest digital solutions are Jot Live Shopping and Jot Affiliate Manager. Jot Live allows your representatives, influencers, and even the company to live sell products through video streaming with just a couple of clicks by guest shoppers. Jot Live is modular, designed to integrate into your enterprise, and is extremely cost effective. The Jot Affiliate Manager allows you to reward your retail customers for socially sharing their excitement for your products while ensuring your sales organization still receives their commissions. Visit GenCon.com for more information and to schedule a discovery call today. That's J-E-N-K-O-N.com. Now let's get back to the interview with Brian Gill. I also like that you talked about, we have to be aware, uh, we have to keep our kind of eyes on the horizon for these new technologies, um, these new tools that we know are going to impact our businesses and our lives, but also to not lose sight of solving our distributors and customers' problems on a daily basis. I think it's, I think it's really easy to get distracted by, by some of these things. Again, they're very important. We need to familiarize and over time understand how they kind of how those tools are going to end up fitting in our toolbox. But kind of going back to what we were talking about is just making sure that we're kind of trying harder, that we're meeting the needs and the expectations of, of those that are kind of already with us. As you talked about kind of the, the general competition that we operate in the space, I'm curious, are there other ways or other things you're seeing that we can do to help kind of compete better um, in this increasingly gig economy? Yeah, I have a fun perspective on this. Um, again, DSA, DSU events. Back in the day, Wayne, when we were at our companies together, the industry was not very united. It was very competitive. We were each other's competitors and that was the truth, right? It was, it was us against them. And that's not the way it is anymore. And I like that. And I think that's important because we have a new threat. We have Uber and DoorDash and other gig opportunities that are a threat to us. And it reminds me of an, an old Arab proverb that says, let me see if I can get this right. I against my brother, I and my brother against our cousin, I, my brother, and my cousin against the world. So back in, you know, when we were kind of coming up in 2000 to 2010, I felt like it was I against my brother. Companies in the direct sales industry, we were our competitors and our enemies, so to speak. But when the gig opportunity came into play, all of a sudden, I and my brother united against our cousin. And we're looking to ramp up and compete against gigs. So Let's call that, I have this stand up, stand together, stand out philosophy. And I and my brother against our cousin, meaning all direct sales companies against other gig opportunities, is standing together. And that's what happens at DSU and DSA events and all other similar events. We talk best practices, and those things are shared freely these days. And I think that is so important. Um, I don't think that your fast start program, your tweak to the compensation plan, you're getting on Amazon, you're starting a social influencer program. 
you're making your return policy more generous and the list goes on. These are not competitive advantages, in my opinion, from company A and company B. These are the things that we need to find out about together, try them, come back to these events, share those best practices in those forums, the panels, as keynote speakers. Ryan Napierski from NewScan in the past year or two has done a great job of talking about reputation and even building the collaboration amongst our companies even more. And I think that that is absolutely the right direction. It's table stakes for us to compete and win against Uber, DoorDash, and the other gig opportunities to, to upgrade all of that stuff as quickly as possible. So that's stand together. Um, stand up is, I, I can probably talk about that another time. That's stand up for me is I and my brother, I and my brother and my cousin, all of the gigs standing up to regulators because our industry is heavily regulated. And, and I don't mean stand up in a disrespectful way or a confrontational way. They, their job is to protect the consumer with, from label claims and marketing claims and the FDA and the FTC want that. And guess what? So do we. We love our customers more than they do. And so I think that we stand up against regulators by speaking their love language, which is regulation. And the more that we self-regulate, the more that corporate makes sure that its claims are truthful, not misleading and substantiated, the better off we are in the eyes of the regulators and in our own businesses. So that's kind of stand up, stand together, I covered, right? That's mm -hmm. best practices. Come to these events, DSU, DSA, come to these events. Don't just participate. Don't just have your notepad out and don't say a word about your company. Take the notes home and you know, say to your executive team, look what I learned. I didn't give up anything, but here's what I learned. You know, Come to receive, but also come to these events to give and our industry will rise. So now there's one more. There's stand up, stand together, and stand out. Stand out is where I believe as companies in the direct sales industry, we can compete against each other. And I think that we should. I don't think that we necessarily have to hold hands all the time and cooperate. At the brand level is where we should compete fiercely. And again, it's not in a, a disrespectful way or a you're my enemy way. It's actually in a mutually beneficial way. What I think is not good for our industry is when we can be lumped together as, oh, is this one of those direct selling or multi-level marketing or network marketing companies? Because in my mind, when somebody says that, they lump us together as uh, you have the best products, the best opportunity and the best charitable offering, right? Mm -hmm. That's how we're watered down and made generic. I want the companies in this industry to focus on their brand connections and try so hard that it's just like my experience at the dentist. When someone says to you, this product is clinically proven to reduce gingivitis and plaque better than the regular toothbrush you're using, that brand and that product offering and the supporting material is so compelling that no one will think to say, okay, that sounds cool, but is this a, is this a network marketing company? No, they won't care. So For Life is the immune system company. That's our stake in the ground for 25 years. And that's our personality, that's our brand, that's our credibility, that's our science, that's everything. So that's what you mean by kind of competing at the brand level. So really getting out and promoting your products, your brand, and making customers fall in love with them, having great experiences to absolutely fall in love. So focusing on that awareness, affinity, brand preference, I just want to clarify, that's what you mean by kind of competing at the brand level. That is exactly what I mean. Yeah, we have to have strong brands. Strong brands will make our products, promotions, everything better, Every, sales, retention, everything's better because you're subscribing to a tribe and a brand that people connect with. Again, 
people yeah. are out there. They're they're on platforms. They have megaphones. They have preferences and things they like. And those are the people that you you will and should attract. And they are going to be loyal. And, and that's how we become stronger. So I, I know we I I don't know why we don't name companies when we talk publicly like this, but we just don't. I, I don't know. But when I think of a lot of companies in this industry, I can think of the company that we worked at, and I know exactly what they do. I can think mm -hmm. of the other company that we worked at, and I know exactly why they're a strong brand. And I think that every company should be able to say, this is who we are, and that everybody else should be able to know that as well, so that no one can, so that no one can ever say again, is this one of those network marketing companies, and we all have the best products, comp plan, and foundation. Like that needs to go away. And we just need to become companies that have awesome brands and products that just, just supersede the whole industry. Yeah, that, that transcend, um, you know, any preconceived notion. I think that's a really, um, that's a really interesting idea. And I think that a lot of us kind of do that. We focus on it. I think, again, I think we can try harder. I love that really focusing on creating brands and the awareness, that preference, but that people love, that people desire, that people will walk through walls uh, to get to. And I think also kind of getting back, and this is a little bit of my soapbox, but I think inherent in what you just said, and one of the ways that we can really compete with these other companies and create these highly desirable brands is to get really good at setting, meeting, and exceeding expectations. I think historically that's um, that's been the speed bump for us in this channel is we get so excited about, um, you know, and anyone that's marketing a product or, uh, you know, an opportunity can, but we get really excited about the most extreme success cases from a compensation plan structure or, uh, benefits from a product standpoint, but really from the very get go setting, meeting and exceeding expectations, we're going to win every time. If we can do just that we're going to leave millions of satisfied customers and distributors or affiliates in, in our wake. And I mean that positively, not, not kind of negatively <laughs> leaving them in our wake, but we will just leave, you know, such high volumes, such incredible number of really satisfied people that then go on to say amazing things about those companies. But I also love that you touched on the collaboration that exists in the channel. That's one of the things that I have loved the most. I know Stuart and DSN, um, have fought fiercely um, for that collaboration and provide incredible forums for that. And um, I just love that. That's something I love about the company. I, we don't see competition in the same way we see collaboration or community. Um, but yeah, I love that. There's so many amazing thoughts there. And, and I want to slide in a little bit um, and talk about product. I, I know product's important to all of us for life launched with some really incredible uh, product technology or ingredient technology and kind of going back to focus. I think that's one thing that for life has done really well over the years is stay focused. It hasn't chased kind of the shiny new technology or, or category, but it's really focused on, we are the immune company. You know, this is, this is who we are and, and we build products that are kind of perfectly built and purpose built uh, for that end. And I think a lot of other direct selling companies kind of start with that end in mind. They'll, they'll find this unique technology or product and launch it. And over time, you need to create excitement and you need to grow. And so you, you want to grow the pie. And I'm kind of saying that in, in quotes a little bit because you, know, you and I have sat in meetings where there's been, how do we grow the pie? How do we make it bigger? And so we often chase uh, products or uh, initiatives that maybe don't reinforce that, that brand positioning. And we can kind of get lost from a product portfolio standpoint and years down the road, we kind of look at it and we're like, how did we, how did we get here? How do we rationalize back to something that makes sense, something that consumers and distributors can navigate their way through and where there's a logical either entry point or progression through the portfolio. Can you talk a little bit about how for life has been able to maintain this focus on transfer factor on immune support and keep it fresh, keep it new. Um, and most importantly, relevant to today's consumer, you know, transfer factor has been around for 25 years, yet there's still incredible demand. The company is growing. How have you been able to kind of balance that focus with freshness, I guess? Yeah, great question. So 
So yeah, we've been around since 1998. That's 25 years of transfer factor. So how do we keep it fresh? Well, principle number one is it's still unknown to most people. If you think of a heavy hitting immune system ingredients, fan favorites, things in Costco, you should be thinking vitamin C, zinc, elderberry, echinacea, um, the list goes on of, of these ones that come to mind right away. Transfer factor doesn't come to mind right away. So as a company, that's important that we know that most people in consumer land are not familiar with transfer factor. So to some extent, we can beat the same drum. We just need to keep giving our distributors the right tools so that they can educate about it. Uh, second is transfer factor works. It's, it's a peptide molecule that, that just flat out works. And so uh, third principle is, this is kind of fun for me. My personal philosophy is I'd like to live by this, that everything is boring. Everything is boring. And it's kind of like trying harder. So if I'm going to give a presentation or be on a podcast or lead a meeting or try to help my kids through something, hearing dad drone on about that's boring. Everything is boring. And if you can have that mindset and really get in the shoes of the people you're talking to and, and have a brand connection with them, something that will really light them up where you, where you connect and credibility is exchanged. That is what we need to find. And so let me talk about two approaches that, that I think are true. So if I'm going to talk about transfer factor, the, the kind of a, one way to do it and the way that has traditionally been done, and maybe I want to call it the old way, is, Wayne, do you have 30 minutes uh, or 15 minutes I could meet you at a shop and we could just have a drink and, um, or you can come to my home and I want to tell you about this product and this ingredient. And I would tell you about For Life and the founders. And I'm actually, I'm actually going to tell you a little bit about Transfer Factor. And just, I'm not saying it's going to be good or bad, but just, just note to yourself and everybody listening as I explain this, and this is the way that I think we historically have done it. Just how does it sit with you? Okay. So Wayne, Transfer Factor is an important peptide or molecule that is transferred from mother to child at birth. It's transferred through the colostrum, mother's first milk. So what does it do? It's an immune system education peptide. It's what teaches the naive immune system of the baby how to function properly. It's an education molecule. Without it, the newborn human, cow, whatever, it, it, it's the immune system doesn't know how to work properly without transfer factor. Are you with me? Wayne, hello, are you excited? I'm so uh, you excited. Might be, you might be, but you might, I might have lost you and I might have <laughs> lost some people out there. And I can say for life transfer factor helps recognize, respond, remember the three R's. And I can go into that. And, and some people who are at a point where maybe they have a, a immune system interests, they might be like hanging on every word. But for most people, everything is boring and we need to try harder. And that's where the brand connection comes in. And we tried harder with the product that I talked about called Immune Boost and the clinical study that we came up with. So now I'm gonna try another approach. I'm not gonna start at the beginning and progress you forward to the point. I'm gonna start at the tip of the spear and I'm gonna work backwards. So I'm gonna start over. Hey Wayne, did you know that four life transfer factor is clinically proven to activate your immune system within two hours? And now I can tell you're super excited and you're going to say, really, that's cool. I'm very interested in an immune system product that works quickly. And so what did you say? Transfer factor. Tell me more about that. And then I would tell you what transfer factor is and does once I have earned your interest through something compelling. And that's where the brand connection comes in. That's where everything is boring comes in. That's where try harder comes in. And where the uh, importance of focusing on problems. If you can solve yes. people's problems, 
that's a great way uh, to get them to to want to desire to need a product right away. Where, yeah, if you're getting into some of the, you know, a little bit of the high level explanation or even down too low in the weeds, when you're talking to a potential distributor, affiliate, customer, what's a problem that you can solve? that you can come in right away and solve and, and to have that. I think that's a really powerful approach because we do make decisions emotionally and then back them up kind of with logic and reason. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really interesting approach. I also think one of the things that um, has really helped a, a, around keeping things fresh is the fact that you created a literal kind of product platform out of transfer factor and this idea around immune system support. So it isn't just this, you know, this one thing that you're, you know, the same drum that you're beating, you know, for 25 years, but you keep it fresh, you keep it connected. You've, you've turned it into a tire product platform, which then in turn is a platform for growth, uh, which is, I think a really great strategy when it comes to, to product and building out a portfolio. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. So how does, how does the immune system tie into everything else? How do we make that a platform that is meaningful to everybody? Um, I don't think that most people think about their immune system every day or all year round. And something we're trying to do at For Life is to punctuate the importance of the immune system. Because when you don't have your immune system health up functioning, functioning well, Nothing else matters. I think there's a, there's a great quote that's really punchy. It's something like, if you don't have your health, nothing else matters. Sure. Well, a lot of that is referring to the immune system. If that's down and you're down and out in that regard, that's the only thing that matters. And the immune system doesn't just need love from September to February or in times of stress. It's the foundation of all your body's systems. It's intertwined to all of them and it deserves daily respect and attention. And so that's a platform that, that we educate on and communicate. And I think it gives meaning to all of our products. And so, yes, we have, we have a, a line of transfer factor products that are just that, but in our, what we call targeted products, products for your heart, your brain and other systems, they also have transfer factor in those products. And again, that speaks to the fact that yeah, your cardiovascular system is important, but so is your immune system. Here's how they work synergistically. So that's that's how we approach that. And I think it's, yeah, that's a great topic. Yeah, re- really great strategy that you guys have uh, developed and, and maintained, which has led to a lot of success for you. Brian, I think another thing that For Life has been really great at is market and customer segmentation. And the company has found a lot of success within the Hispanic market. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what For Life is doing to attract and serve that Hispanic market here in the U.S. Yeah, first and foremost, we have a strong, wonderful, vibrant uh, Hispanic community at For Life. And we owe that to early leaders. I just want to get that out of the way and thank them for being there for For Life in those early days. Um, so we owe... We owe that if you go to our convention, we're, we're 80 to 85% Hispanic. And so we just try to keep nurturing that, honoring that and respecting that. So we do, um, I think the main thing that we've done in the last five years is that we have stopped translating English to Spanish. We are giving greater honor and respect. We're, we're, we're listening to them. We're putting ourselves in their shoes and not saying, hey, I speak English and I'm Caucasian and we have great translators, that should be good enough. Because it isn't, and we've heard yeah. that. I'm planning a trip to Japan right now in September, and I'm going to a lot of Japan sites that are translated into English. And guess what? I can tell that they have been translated into English. And you know what that is like. You know what translated yeah. English is like. And okay, that's okay if I'm planning a trip to Japan and I'm trying to find a sumo stable where I can go watch a practice. And they don't really, maybe they shouldn't even really care about me because I am a, truly a foreign visitor. So I'm okay with that. But what I'm not okay with is a Hispanic person that lives in this country, their primary language is Spanish, and maybe they can speak English too, and that's great. If not, great. But they should be 
receiving the best, most normal Spanish for them. And so that's something that we've done. It's a problem we've solved. It, it's like we've talked about problems on this. It's a Uber, people did, people wanted short rides, but the drivers didn't want to give. So we heard that and we have been delivering that more and more. And I think that's been uh, really appreciated and a, a good win for everybody all around. Yeah. And not just from a, a translation standpoint, but from a content standpoint, from a program standpoint, from a support standpoint, um, it's not taking something that was built for other markets and repurposing, but, but content that is purpose built for that community. That's right. So yeah, if we were going to have content written about the direct approach podcast uh, with Wayne Moorhead and Brian Gill as a guest, there would be a meeting where we would talk about what it is and what it does high level English writer, Spanish writer, and they go off and they create the promotional materials on their own. So that, gotcha. that's what we do. And it, and it just is better for everybody. Yeah. It kind of gets back to giving the, the affiliates and distributors more power, more freedom, more ability than we probably otherwise would have in the past or had a history of doing. But it's really about empowering that distributor and affiliate now to go share the brand. Exactly. Because we've made a brand connection. There's credibility. A, a, a poor translation is not a credible connection that they're right. proud to share. So that's where we try harder and we, we offer that value, that credibility exchange. And so, yeah, a beautiful tie-in. Another thing that comes to mind is that um, our Hispanic community is fun. And I want to say they're more fun than I am. For sure. I, I want, you don't have to agree like so quickly. No, I didn't mean you. I, I mean, was actually referring to me. They're, of yeah, course, okay. they're more fun than you, but I meant that they're also, it is an amazing community. Um, yeah. I always love uh, the events, the distributors, the people, such, such amazing, such amazing individuals and amazing community. Yeah. So we're fortunate. I, so I'm just going to say me, they're more fun than I am. And <laughs> not, not to put down any other, any other people or people's but I, I challenge you, you can direct message me if you are more fun than the, the Hispanic people at Four Life. They're just, they're just fun. And, and we try to honor that. We, we foster that culture at our conventions. They're, they just bring a great spirit and energy to everything. So it's just it's fun to be part of. Yeah, thank you. Again, it's been amazing watching Four Life really support and build um, that business within the Hispanic community. So Brian, we're starting to kind of come to the end of our time and I wanted to get your thought on leadership. I've been fortunate to have kind of a front row seat um, throughout your career and have watched you kind of grow and develop into a really in incredible leader and incredible marketer. And I'm curious, can you share a little bit about maybe some of the best leadership lessons uh, or most important lessons you learned by leading a marketing organization within direct selling? Yeah, this is where my heart is right now. Thank you for addressing this topic. Back in the day when we worked together, I think you called me the machine. Uh, my Your job was the machine. Company wide, it was called the machine. My job for you and the company was to crank out awesome stuff. As I came up the path of, you know, the, the content side of a brand, um, writing, editing, communication, social media, PR, corp com, all that stuff, the written word, the spoken word. And I just crank stuff out. And as I grew in opportunity and responsibility to manage people, you have to make a shift. Um, there's, a, there's kind of a middle time where you need to crank out a lot still, but you really need to lead your team. And um, as you continue, it shifts even more towards leadership. Uh, a, a philosophy that I was taught um, earlier in my career that has stuck with me is a team of leaders. Uh, we had a gentleman by the name of Paul Gustafson come in and train our company on a team of leaders concept where the, the leader, the big boss is not, is not the smartest one that just hires people in writing and design and video and events and recognition and translation, and then knows everything better than they do and tells them what to do. That is not a team of leaders. A team of leaders is where the head of a department or a company hires experts, ninjas at what they do. And I, this is what I do. I'm, I'm in every interview. For, I'm, in, I'm in 
the final interview for every person we hire. No one gets hired in marketing without me meeting with them in person and telling them, if we hire you, we're hiring you because we believe that you're an expert at what you do, that you're the best at it. No one in this company is going to tell you um, how to write and video and create and design an event and recognition better than you. We expect you to be the best, to come with fresh ideas, to stay educated on your area of expertise. And whether they're the premier expert in the world at that or not at the time, they are given the charge to continuously grow and educate. And, you know, when, like for social media, uh, let's see, what is Elon Musk is changing the Twitter bird to the X. I expect my social media people to know about that before I do and to be the ones that are telling people if it's relevant. And so a team of leaders is all about respect. And I, I try to make that super clear. And um, I think that works well because people feel validated and respected and they have ownership over what they do. And that is when people do their best work. I love that. The, the team of leaders is such an incredible uh, idea and approach. And I know you've uh, done a great job of building out incredible marketing teams there. And you're always amazing at helping to share and shine the spotlight on, on each and every one of them and help develop them. I've learned a lot from you so much over the years. Uh, one of the things, again, beyond all of the marketing is just you have an incredible growth mindset. You're always learning, you're always developing, you're always improving, and you're amazing at sharing all of those insights with, with those around you. So thank you for that. Thank you for your friendship and your leadership. Thank you for an awesome last hour plus. Uh, this has been a real treat for me, been really fun. For any of the listeners that want to hear more from Brian, and I know you do, make sure you're at DSU October 11th through 12th. Uh, Brian will be speaking and sharing more of his incredible insights there. Brian, thank you so much for being on today. Thanks, Wayne. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the event. Uh, thanks for the, the podcast opportunity today. It's good to be with you again. Um, maybe I'll just close by saying you're still my hero. <laughs> well, we'll edit that out, but thank, thanks so much to yeah. Danny and everybody, <laughs> everybody there at 4Life High for us. Will do. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks, Brian. Thank you for tuning in. Please take a minute to give a five-star rating and review to help Direct Approach continue to provide candid interviews and insights for direct selling corporate executives. And register today for DSU at dsu2023.com to take advantage of the incredible content and networking opportunities on October 11th and 12th at the Fall 2023 event in Irving, Texas. Thank you for listening and supporting DSN and the Direct Approach Podcast.